Hello friends, welcome to a new video. In today's lesson, I shall discuss Jonathan Swift's masterpiece, Gulliver's Travels. In this introductory discussion, I will talk about the historical context in which Swift wrote, the setting of the plot, and the synopsis of the novel. This lesson will introduce you with all the key facts about Gulliver's Travels that you must know to understand the novel. We call this novels Gulliver's Travels. But when it was published, it was called Travels into Several Remote Nations of the World in four parts by Lemuel Gulliver, first a surgeon and then a captain of several ships. And man, this book was explosive, a clear attack on both George I, who was then the King of England, and on the Whig government. There was no way Jonathan Swift was going to attach his name to the novel's first edition even though it became a huge bestseller. After all, he did not want to be arrested. So, the 1726 edition of Gulliver's Travels is anonymous and claims to be written by its main character, Lemuel Gulliver, first a surgeon, then a captain of several ships. Before I proceed further, I want to ask a question. In my last video on Jonathan Swift, I told you how Swift had become friends with the prominent literary figures of his time and become a member of the Martina Scribblerus Club. If you want to know more about Scribblerus Club, you can watch my video. The link is in the description and also in the i button. Now the question is, who among the following writers was not a member of Scribblerus Club? These are your options. I will tell you the answer at the end of the lesson. Let's begin our discussion without further delay. The Martina Scribblerus Club proposed to satirize the follies and vices of learned scientific and modern men. Each of the members was given a topic, and Swift was to satirize the numerous and popular volumes describing voyages to faraway lands. At that time, everyone was eager to hear about cultures and people in the faraway lands, where explorers were claiming colonies for England. Gulliver's travels developed out of this assignment. In Gulliver's Travels, Swift satirizes these travel writers as well as gullible, naive, foolish English readers eager for outrageous tall tales about other countries. Swift did not stop there and expanded his target. He attacked what he considered were people's most conspicuous vices. Now let's briefly talk about historical context of Gulliver's Travels. In the early 18th century, Britain's political atmosphere underwent a dramatic shift. While Queen Anne sat on the throne from 1665 to 1714, the Tory party was in favour and dominated politics with their conservative agenda of minimised parliamentary power and increased royal authority. Yet, when King George I took power in 1714, the Liberal Whig party, the opponents of conservative Tory party, came into power. One of these stories was Jonathan Swift and parts of Gulliver's travels, especially Gulliver's adventure in Lilliput, satirized the Whigs and Tory struggle against each other. If you want to know more about this conflict between Tory and Whigs, you can watch my video which you will find in the description. Gulliver's travels is divided into four books and each of the book is set in various remote locations. The first book is set in the imaginary nations of Lilliput and Blefasco. Second book is set in Brobdingnang. The third book describes his voyage in Laputa, Glabdabdrib, Lagnag and in Japan. The last book is set in the land of Huynims. Now let's briefly discuss the synopsis of the plot. Lamuel Gulliver is a married surgeon from Nottinghamshire, England, who has a passion for travelling. In his voyage to the South Seas, he is caught in a storm and washed off on an island. This island, Lilliput, has a population of tiny people, about 6 inches tall. They capture Gulliver as he sleeps and they begin attacking him with bows and arrows when he tries to break free. When Gulliver promises not to harm the Lilliputians, they bring him food and drink and take him to their capital. There, the emperor consults with his wisest men about their giant prisoner. 
दे ओरी गालीभर कूड एस्केप और कॉज अ फेमाइन बिकॉज ऑफ द ह्यूज क्वान्टिटी ऑफ फूड गालीभर टेक्स आफ्टर ई एग्रीज टू एसिस्ट देम उथ सिविल ड्यूटीज एंड ऑल्सो इन वार द लिलीपुटियन सेट इम फ्री एंड गिव हिम प्लेंटी टू इट देन रेल ड्रेसल अ फ्रेंड एंड गवर्नमेंट ऑफिसियल टेल्स गालीभर अबाउट द थ्रेट ऑफ इन्वेशन फ्रॉम दोज लिविंग ऑन द आईलैंड ऑफ ब्लेफास्को इयर्स अर्लियर द लिलीपुटियंस डिसग्रीड उथ देम ओवर हुईच एंड ऑफ एन एग शुड बी क्रैक्ट द डिस्प्यूट लेड टू सिक्स रेबेलियंस एंड थाउजेंड्स ऑफ डेथ्स वेन द लिलीपुटियंस एंड ब्लेफास्कूडियंस गो टू वार अगेन गालीफार प्रूव टू बी भेरी यूजफुल ही ड्रैक्स द एंटायर फ्लीट ऑफ शिप्स ऑफ ब्लेफास्कू टू द शोर ऑफ लिलीपुट द एम्पेर देन ग्रैंड्स गालीफार द टाइटल ऑफ नारडाक द हाइस्ट ऑनर ऑफ द आईलैंड ऑफ लिलीपुट बट गालीफार रिजेक्ट्स द एम्पेर इंजिस्टेंस ऑन डिस्ट्रॉइंग द पीपुल ऑफ ब्लेफास्कू एंड मेकिंग ब्लेफास्कू इन टू अ प्रोविंस ऑफ लिलीपुट इंस्टेड गालीफार वेलकम्स एन एम्बेसि फ्रम ब्लेफास्कू ऑफरिंग पीस हुई इज द एम्पेर हेज नो चयस बाट टू एक्सेप्ट अ फ्यू डेज लैटर हुएन अ फायर स्टार्ट इन द एम्प्रेस चेम्बर ऑफ द पैलेस गालीफार एक्सटिंग उज द फ्लेम्स बै यूरिनेटिंग ऑन देम In spite of the great service that Gulliver has done for the Lilliputians, he has two terrible enemies, who seem to be jealous of his strength and favor with the emperor, the admiral Skyres Bolgolam, and the treasurer Frimnap. These two men conspired to influence the emperor, and Gulliver is charged with treason for a variety of offenses, including urinating on the royal palace. refusing to reduce blefasco to a province aiding the ambassadors of blefasco when they came to ask for peace and planning to visit blefasco it is finally decided that galifar's eyes will be put out as a punishment but the ministers also decide in secret that they are going to starve galifar to save money on the enormous amount of food he eats Gulliver is informed of this plot against him by a friend at the Lilliputian court. Although Gulliver respects the Lilliputian laws, which severely punishes dishonesty, he soon sees how ridiculous and petty creatures these tiny people are. He manages to escape to the island of Blefasco. Fortunately for him, a human-sized boat washes ashore on Blefasco. Gulliver rows to nearby Australia and finds a boat. to take him back to england there he set sail and is picked up by a merchant ship upon his return home galiva shows up the lilliputian sized livestock he has smuggled home in his pockets and makes a solid profit galiva goes out to sea again after a brief stay in england with his family he does not seem to like his family all that much once again a storm blows up and galivar is stranded on the island of brobdingnag the brobdingnagians are immense giants 60 feet tall and galivar feels like a lilliputian there galivar's crew abandons him out of fear after he wanders away looking for water a farmer carries galivar to his home after almost stepping on him he treats galivar like an attraction at a fair and forces him to perform exhausting tricks Then he sells Gulliver to Brobdingnagian's queen. Queen employs farmer's daughter Glamdal Clitch to look after Gulliver and teach him their language. Glamdal Clitch does this with great affection. Queen is amused because he is so tiny and yet still manages to speak and act like a real person. Gulliver experiences a series of dangers due to his small size. Bees, the size of pigeons, almost stab him a puppy almost tramples him to death a monkey mistakes him for a baby monkey and tries to stuff him full of food the ladies at court treat him like a toy by dressing and undressing him galiver reflects on how overwhelmed and repulsed the lilliputians must have felt by his enormous presence galiver also feels ridiculous all the time and he starts to lose some of his pride and self importance the brobdingnagian king strengthens this new sense of humility after galiver describes to him all that he can think about english culture and history the king of brobdingnagian decides that 
English people sounds like tiny little pests. He absolutely refuses to accept Gulliver's gift of gunpowder because such weapons seem like an invitation to horrible violence and abuse. After two years at Brobdingnag, Gulliver is seized by a giant eagle who drops him into the sea where he is rescued by a passing ship and finally returns home to England. Back among humans, Gulliver is astonished by their littleness. He only stays there for about two months and goes to seas again. Gulliver is on a ship bound for Levant. After arriving, Gulliver is assigned as a captain of a sloop that is a sailing vessel with a single mast to visit a nearby islands and establish trade. On this trip, pirates attack the sloop on a small island near Vietnam and place Gulliver in a small boat to fend for himself. While drifting at sea, he sees a shadow passing overhead, a floating island called Laputa. He signals the Laputans for help and is brought up by rope. He meets the Laputan king and observes life on Laputa. Gulliver finds Laputa boring because the men are obsessed with abstract mathematical, musical and astronomical theory and are much more intelligent than he is. They are utterly incompetent about practical matters and can barely hold a conversation. They often get lost into mathematical thoughts. They carry around flappers. Flappers are servants used for hitting them during conversation in order to keep them focused. Gulliver is disgusted when he visits the city of Lagado below and sees the destructive influence the Laputan's theories have had turning a once functioning people into a broken society. He tours the academy where the projectors contrive useless scientific projects. Gulliver then visits the barren land of Balnibarbi, where the scientists constantly work on pointless experiments like trying to extract sunlight from cucumbers and turning excrement back into food again. He thinks the professors are crazy because they propose studying excrement to find traitors and taxing people based on beauty and weight. Gulliver also visits Glabdab Drib, an island of magicians, sorcerers, where he gets chance to meet the ghosts of famous historical figures. He also visits Lagnag, which is an island with an absolute king and also some very unfortunate immortal Stralbergs. He envies them, but soon finds they are depressed and jealous of mortals' ability to die. Gulliver finally arrives in Japan where he meets the Japanese emperor. From there he goes to Amsterdam and eventually to England once more, this time for five months, before he sets out again leaving his family behind. Now he is the captain of his own ship, his ship bound for Barbados and Leeward Islands. Unfortunately, several of his crew members became ill and die on the voyage. Gulliver hires several replacement sailors in Barbados. They turn out to be pirates who convince the other crew members to mutiny. As a result, Gulliver is deposited on an island to fend for himself. Almost immediately, he is discovered by a herd of ugly, despicable human-like creatures who are called, he later learns, Yahoos. They attack him by climbing trees and defecating on him. He is saved from this disgrace by the appearance of a horse, identified, he later learns, by the name of Hoenims. The grey horse, a Hoenim, takes Gulliver to his home, where he is introduced to Grey's mayor, that is his wife, a colt and a foal, that is their children, and a sorrel nag, who was the servant. Gulliver also sees that the Yahoos are kept in pens away from the house. It becomes immediately clear that, except for Gulliver's clothing, he and the Yahoos are the same animal. From this point on, Gulliver and his master, that is the grey horse, begin a series of discussion about the evolution of Yahoos, about concepts and behaviors related to the Yahoo society, which Gulliver represents, and about the society of the Hoenims. The Hoenims govern themselves with absolute reason. They do not even have words for humans' problems like disease, 
deception or war the more gulliver learns from the hoenims the more he admires their uprightness egalitarianism and reason and he eventually turns against humankind wanting to live forever among the hoenims as for the yahus they are human beings they are just like gulliver except that gulliver has learned to clip his nails save his face and wear clothes in hoenim land gulliver finally realizes the true depths of human awfulness unpleasantness he becomes so used to the hoenim way of life that when the hoenim finally tell him to leave he immediately faints gulliver obediently leaves the land of hoenim where he has been very happy he builds a canoe and sails to the nearby island where he is eventually found hiding by a crew from a portuguese ship the ship's captain don pedro returns gulliver to lisbon where he lives in the captain's home gulliver is so repelled by the sight and smell of these civilized yahus that he can't stand to be around them eventually however gulliver agrees to return to his family in england upon his arrival he is repelled by his yahoo family so he buys two horses and spends most of his time caring for and conversing with the horses in the stable in order to be as far away from his yahoo family as possible the book ends here now let's go back to the question the correct answer is option a samuel johnson johnson was a member of a club and the name of the club was the literary club or simply the club this society was originally set up by the artist joshua reynolds in 1764 to provide samuel johnson with ready conversation and dining company the group would meet once a week for supper and debate at the turks head tavern in soho london often talking and drinking into the early hours that's all for today thank you for listening